Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews on How To, and on today's video, we'll be taking a slightly in depth look at the Ryzen 5 4600G, a crazy little six core processor with integrated Vega 7 graphics, which costs less than £100 currently in the UK, $89.99 from Amazon.co.uk. But is it worth buying? Is it actually any good? Can you play games on it? Let's find out. Okay, so in today's video, we'll be taking a look at the Ryzen 5 4600G. This is a uh, Zen 2 based processor, slightly older now, but was originally only available to OEMs and system integrators, is now available on the retail market. And it's something which actually I have completely missed. I've uh, gone through all the other processors like 5600G, etc., 3400G, but this is one which I have not been able to test until now. So, pretty excited to see what it can actually do. In terms of pricing to its kind of siblings, you're looking at the 5600G currently in the UK being somewhere in the region of about 20 to 25 pounds more expensive and is only moderately more powerful in terms of the newer architecture that it's using. So yeah, very pleased to be able to finally take a look at this one. So in terms of specifications, you're looking at six cores, 12 threads, base clocks of 3.7 gigahertz and a boost clock of 4.2. Although, weirdly, I've seen 4.3, and in some strange instance, I actually saw 5.2. Uh, I'm not sure if that was some glitch with the software, but I did keep a, uh, a picture of it just so you can see it. It does perform particularly well. You have an option of using either 45 watts or 65 watt TDPs. I've been done all my testing on 65 watt TDPs, and surprisingly, this thing absolutely sips power in its kind of low states, uh, basically just on your desktop idling looking at somewhere around four watts. So if you're looking for an energy saving processor, then potentially this could be right up your street. And even when it's running full tilt, running a Cinebench loop, you're looking at somewhere around about 70 watts, 65 to 70 watts. So certainly does stay within that power envelope that has been stated by the manufacturer. In terms of the built-in graphics, so this is using the Vega 7. So that's seven CU units with up to 1900 megahertz as being its boost clock and actually runs okay. You do have a slight limitation of this, so you can actually only physically allocate up to two gigabytes of RAM to the actual onboard graphics, although realistically for that sort of kind of class of processor, you don't really need that. It also does support dynamic RAM usage as well. So if you just set it to auto, it'll basically use whatever it needs to from the lowest being around about 400 megabytes up to like two gigabytes. Obviously, if you go over that envelope, you're not going to magically get more RAM to it, but it will share with the system and kind of send textures, etc., in and out of the main system RAM, which does slow things down, but potentially is possible. Predominantly, this is going to be for either 720p high or 1080p low settings. I have done some testing with a, uh, a splattering of games, so we'll take a look at some of those. And also, I did actually test with a extra graphics card, so I did actually put in a 1063 gig card which are pretty easily available these days and you can pick them up quite cheaply. So if you're thinking maybe you're gonna get this, get your system up and running, then put a graphics card with it, then you can do. You are gonna be limited with this to PCI Express Gen 3 at the most. So if you're thinking of getting a newer graphics card like an RX 6600 or maybe a newer Nvidia card, then potentially it's probably not gonna be worth doing that because you are gonna be slightly limited on your bandwidth. And if you go for a, a Gen 4 card, which is only got on times eight bus, Again, you are going to struggle and you're going to be limiting it a little bit. But this isn't really what it's designed for. This, in my opinion, is designed for small media center PCs or very modest gaming PCs. Or if you just want to do a little flip system and not spend a great deal on your processor and graphics card, then yeah, this could be the answer. So let's take a look at some gameplay and see what it's all about. So we're going to start off with Wreckfest. This is running 1080p, lowest settings. I have actually done two runs of this, one at low and one at medium. So running at low, you're looking at averages between 60 and 75 frames per second. If you decide to go for medium, just to get the textures looking a little bit nicer, a little bit crisper, then you will drop a little bit and you'll be looking at somewhere between 45 and 60 frames per second. Overall, the frame times aren't exactly stellar, but it certainly is playable, enjoyable. Again, if you don't have the money for a standalone graphics card, then uh, what else are you going to do? Next up, a synthetic. So this is 3D Mark's Time Spy. So with this, we did get a score of 1540, which isn't exactly brilliant, but again, for what it is, it's absolutely fine. That was made up of a GPU score of 1,357 points and the CPU score of 6,619 points. 
Another synthetic, but looking more at the actual processor side rather than the graphics side, now we've got Cinebench R23. So this has a score of 9,288. Now some of the footage you'll be seeing isn't the actual footage from what I was doing. I failed to record it after doing a boss update, so my apologies there. You can see roughly what it's running at in terms of temperatures. Those were pretty much the same. And you can see there we're looking at anywhere between four watts at idle up to around about 70 watts under load. And temperatures also kept well in check. I have used a 120 mil tower cooler, a very inexpensive one. And again, for this kind of level of processor, even using a smaller stock cooler, such as the one that's included, the Wraith Stealth, you're gonna be absolutely fine. Back to some gameplay. So let's take a look at Fortnite. So this is running Fortnite with its auto settings. I believe it's gonna be DirectX 11 and somewhere kind of mixing around medium settings, medium draw distance, etc. This is what it dialed up for itself. And you can expect to see around about 60 frames per second on average. Now obviously this game and all the settings are infinitely customizable. So if you want that epic draw distance, you can certainly lower all your settings or perhaps even use performance mode to trim things right down and get your frame rates up to the kind of 150s, 200 frames per second. Ultimately, it's gonna be down to you, but I thought I'd give a representation of what it will do out of the box with the default settings. Overall, very playable, uh, got a few kills in there. It is a little bit laggy in certain places. Again, this is with the system optimized settings, which maybe are a little bit too much for this humble little APU. Next up, something older and easier to run, although if you do turn the eye candy up, then it does get a little bit more challenging. So this is Rocket League. Again, we're running here at 1080p. This is actually high settings, but we do have motion blur turned off. And you can expect to see averages of around about 60 FPS, which is absolutely fine. And we were getting up to 75 in some instances. Not too many drops, runs pretty smoothly, enjoyable experience. Again, if you want to pair it with a graphics card, you are going to get much, much better performance. But if you can't afford one or you don't have one or haven't got room in your case for one, then this is going to be absolutely fine if Rocket League is your bag. Next up, we've got Far Cry 5 New Dawn. Now, this is actually a little bit harder to run. And we've got now 1080p and we've reduced it down to low settings across the board. Still not great. We're still not hitting 60 FPS. And we do have the graphics set to native, so there's no scaling, FSR, all that kind of stuff. You can move the slider considerably in this game, so you can have it effectively running 720p and uh, enhanced. But at the stock settings, 1080p low settings with native resolution, you're looking at somewhere between 35 and 45 frames per second. If you do the benchmark, then you'll be looking at an average of 30 FPS, which is basically console gameplay. Another oldie, but a goodie, this is CSGO. Again, 1080p, this is high settings, so this is basically what the system has selected for itself. Again, very enjoyable. If you want ultra competitive, obviously you turn down those settings and you can get your FPS right up there. But this is actually fine. Got a couple of kills in and actually won the round. Uh, you're looking at anywhere between 75 and 100 FPS as an average. Now this is one that I didn't really want to run, but I figured someone's gonna ask, can it run Cyberpunk? And the answer is yes, it can, although not particularly well. Now this is with Cyberpunk 1080p, just running the benchmark. Um, at first, we had the settings on basically reg regular FSR, and we're looking around about sort of 25 frames per second, sometimes 30 if you're lucky in open scenes. I think with this game, your best bet is to go into the settings and choose FSR Ultra Performance. And then this does knock things up a little bit. You're looking around about a kind of 25 to 50% increase in speeds overall. And we're getting an average now of somewhere between well, about 35 frames per second. We do get dips down to 15, but highs of up to 50. So actually pretty playable. And again, if you don't have a graphics card and you want to play Cyberpunk and you don't want to spend a ton of money, then this might be an option for you. So there you go. There is a quick look at some games and some benchmarks to see what it can actually do. I'll be honest with you, actually, after testing the 5600G, which is a little bit more expensive, I don't really see a huge amount of difference. In benchmarks, there is gonna be fractional differences, but not a great deal. Obviously, the architecture is somewhat different. So this is based on, essentially, the 3000 series Ryzen processors, just with the Vega 7 graphics thrown on top, which is absolutely fine. And again, for 90 pounds here in the UK, it's hard to do much better. Now, this was originally bought for a little mini ITX build that we're going to be doing. As you can see on the desk here, this is the kind of the test bench. So this has been an open air test bench on a very modest motherboard as well. So this is only an A520 chipset. 
So we don't really have any overclocking options whatsoever other than turning on XMP and potentially if you want to changing your load line calibration, which I find actually completely pointless. On auto, it ran much better than it did if I increased the settings. So maybe that's me, maybe it's the board, maybe it's the processors don't like it, I'm not entirely sure. But overall, I'm gonna say for 90 pounds, if you want a low TDP processor, which absolutely sips power on idle. So if, again, if it's a media center or some box, which is just left on all the time, drawing around about four watts in its lowest mode, just basically going on your desktop with things like Steam and all those other things running in the background as well. I think you can't do much better. And in terms of availability, it does seem to be readily available in pretty much most retailers. So there we go. There it has been the Ryzen 5 4600G. Hopefully you like this content. If you have, smash the like button. If you want to see more content like this, hit subscribe and the chime notification and you'll be notified of future video releases. But for now, I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To. And hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.